Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman. I'm the Chief Medical Officer, Executive Vice President and uh, of the CLL Society and a CLL patient myself and uh, three years post CAR-T. But today I'm really lucky to have my friends, uh, Dr. Larry and Sharon Saltzman, um, uh, who are also have an experience to share with CAR-T. And I'll ask you to introduce yourself. Uh, uh, Larry and Sharon, can you introduce yourselves to um, the uh, people listening in? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Larry Saltzman. I am a family physician, although I'm not in practice at the moment. I am a CLL survivor of now over 11 years, and I am the executive research director for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and now am engaged in a research uh, study looking at COVID antibody response in blood cancer patients to the vaccine. And Aaron? bless you for that. That's really interesting. And expect that you might get a few questions on that, even though this session is, is nominally on uh, CAR-T. We, people will ask you about COVID, I am sure. Sharon? Hi, well, I'm Sharon Saltzman. I'm Larry's wife. Uh, 11 or so years ago, I also became a cancer caregiver. Uh, and I spend my time when I'm not involved in health related issues as a freelance graphic designer and photographer. So Larry, uh, you know, both of us as family docs uh, and as long-term CLL patients had to make some big decisions. And uh, tell us a little bit about your journey before you got to CAR-T and, uh, and maybe that can kind of segue into why you decided CAR-T at that point, because it's a big decision and still in CLL and experimental treatment. Well, I, um, I was diagnosed in January of 2010. And for those who follow flavors of CLL, my flavor is a little more on the worst prognostic side. I have an 11Q and 13Q deletions. I am IVGH unmutated and all that kind of stuff. And so um, I have had problems with more so the lymphoma side of it, um, the uh, small cell lymphocytic lymphoma than the CLL side of it, if you will. And my treatments began in 2013 with six months of chemo. I had bendamustine and rituxan. It relapsed and in 2000 and uh, let's say 15-ish, uh, I was started on a brutinib. Uh, and three months after I started, I had to have a right colon removal because of lymph nodes that didn't respond to the abrutinib. And so in January of 2016, I started on a clinical trial of now what we refer to as venetoclax. And honestly, I responded a bit, but then I failed within six months with uh, enlarged lymph nodes again. And so in the summer of 2016, it was actually recommended that I look for a CAR-T trial. Uh, back then they were, as they are now, um, clinical trials. And I set myself up to go to Sloan Kettering in New York to have my T cells extracted. In the meantime, I went on my own little small clinical trial of one, and I had started a combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax at the same time, which is now being studied, but back then it wasn't. As a physician, I just decided to be my own guinea pig with uh, my doctor's uh, oversight. And that worked uh, like a miracle. Everything resolved. Um, I did still have my T cells removed that summer in preparation for CAR-T, but I didn't need it. The combination held me for a little over three years. And in 2019, I had a relapse again with lymph nodes in my neck and a PET scan that summer showed I had more lymph nodes in my chest that were new. And given that there were new, no, no new drugs at the time, and I was already on a combination, which was kind of uh, new and in clinical trials, it was recommended my next 
great hope would be CAR T therapy. So we embarked in searching for a CAR T trial, which we found um, up in Seattle at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, AKA the Hutch, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. And Sharon, how much were you involved? I mean, having, uh... It's, it's the similarities between your situation and Patty, my wife's and my situation are similar in both being family docs, both having CLL. How much were you involved in that decision as the caregiver? Because it's a huge burden on a caregiver. Um, it can be in CAR T. So how much was that a back and forth between you and Larry? How much were you involved? Because in, this is a big decision for your husband, the person you love and have you know, dedicated your life to. Yeah. Right. I, it really wasn't a big decision. It's given all of Larry's uh, ups and downs, the wave of, of his disease progression. I knew back in 2015, 16, that, that CAR T was inevitable. And so at the, at the point that we actually reached 2019 and we were told, go ahead and do it now. Actually, when we decided to do it, so I had no problem with it whatsoever. I had concerns about, will I be able to be the best caregiver I need to be for him? But, but that's different than knowing that he really needed to do that. And actually, when we made the decision, Larry was looked to be extraordinarily healthy. And the only issue was that he had some, his node was coming back and, you know, and, and, and so the idea was, well, let's do this now while he is healthy and he'll get through it and he's strong and this will just be a six, you know, two weeks for leukophoresis and then six weeks. Remind you know, us after. what leukophoresis and is. Um, it, can you, it, yeah, yeah, it's 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 removing. You know, Larry, you you do well. It, it, <laughs> it, they, the, the leukophoresis <laughs> is the first stage where they filter one's blood to remove white blood cells. And from those white blood cells, they get the T cells and those T cells are then infected and injected and they create a renegade T cell that they'll put back and they'll act like little Pac-Men to go eat up the, the leukemia cells. That's the theory. And uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so, so you were hopeful, it? yeah, that it would be yeah, a short- Yeah, I was looking yeah. at eight weeks. You know, that, yeah. that it was, we were going to go out, we were going to do it, we we're going to get through it, and it would be just, you know, a chance to live somewhere else for a few months. <laughs> and yeah. so, yeah, I, I was totally on board with it. And Seattle isn't a bad place to live, you know, if that's where you, you know, went, yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit, um, if you have any advice, either of you, in terms of prep for this, if somebody's considering CAR-T, what kind of things did you think about, you know, because you don't live in Seattle and a lot of people would have to move to have their CAR-T where they're, or was this just not like a big deal? You just, were, was there a lot of prep for you in terms of picking and moving to the city? For us, um, it was comforting actually that our children and grandchildren were up in the Seattle area. So for me, I was doing my own head preparation to get through this for Sharon and I, I think it was comforting, as I said, that we have family up there. And I think um, as far as preparing for it and moving, it, it, I mean, we travel a bunch. So it was just like we're going on an extended trip. What we didn't expect is that after my T cells were removed and prepped and ready to go. And we came back to Seattle for the infusion and the treatment, my CLL had grown into a wildfire. So when we had expected that this would be an uneventful, let's get the treatment. And we understand that there are some side effects to the treatment, which we can discuss if, if we want to go there, that it became a much more troublesome, difficult journey because my CLL had gone out of control and they can't give the treatment if you're really out of control. They can give the treatment when you're prepped and ready, but I was under wildfire. And so it took extra time 
for the wizards up in Seattle to get my CLL under control so that there would be a small window to actually uh, give me the infusion of the treatment. And, and this is what they call bridging therapy, which is you know co more commonly used in acute leukemias because it takes time to prep and make the cells and meanwhile the the cancer can take off. Is that am I understanding that correctly? I, I think yeah, I think you could call it bridging therapy. I mean, um, uh, I actually had uh, before the actual infusion, I think I had uh, two, or three different pulses of uh, treatments. And so they were just, again, trying to get me to a spot where I was stable enough to have the prep for the CAR T, which is a small amount of chemo to prep the bone marrow, to, re, to, re, you know, to have the cells plant themselves there. Um, and yes, I, I think, you know, the bridging is a good word although it was intense, uh, yes. And I, I would point out too that it's unusual. Uh, this is not, um, the, most people do not go through what you went through. I, I, I'm trying to think of another case and I can't generally. No. In CLL being chronic, it's not an issue. We see that with the kids with the acute leukemias where they need some intensive chemo to get it under control while they're waiting for the CAR T cells to be made but it's very rare in CLL that people go through this. So, you know, it's usually, uh, that, that's an unusual circumstance. That's my understanding. Right, I, I wouldn't use my case as the usual. Uh, <laughs> I, would use, I would use my case as a teaching case for those who, you know, run into, you know, some extraordinary uh, problem uh, like I had. So, so, you got through that, you got the CAR T cells. Um, mm -hmm. I remember my CAR T infusion being almost anticlimactic. It was an emotional event, but it's kind <laughs> of like you get this little bag and 20 minutes later it's done. What did Tell me about your experience of actually getting the CAR T cells and then what, what happened from there. Right, so our experience again, because of the bridging therapy that you talked about was a little different uh, in that um, I was ill enough where I was actually hospitalized at the point where they gave me the infusion. And so most of these are done as an outpatient basis. In my case, I was an inpatient hospitalized in bed and the team came in and it wasn't a bag. It was a, a syringe of about, uh, a half a teaspoon of cells and they it was yes you're right it was uneventful in that it was emotional leading up to it but uneventful for the actual infusion um soon afterwards it became eventful again because as some will say there are side effects to the car t and i experienced them as was predicted yep. just sooner than later right right it was it and we were told that it would be approximately two weeks after he received the, the modified T cells. And it was six hours later right. that he ended up having his, his first of the, the two very you know, intense uh, responses. And we're talking about cytokine release syndrome or CRS. Is that what? Yeah. Yes. That, that was yeah. The, yeah, that was the first one in the hospital. Um, the nurse came in. She was so sweet. And she took his hand and said, it's, it's okay, it's, it, it means it's working and it's what we want, <laughs> you'll be okay. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I was most concerned about, I did a lot of reading and a, a lot of reading prior to CAR-T about CAR-T and what a caregiver needed to do. And I would recommend that to anyone who finds themselves as the caregiver to support their loved one or whomever, um, to, to read as much as you can. And we were lucky in Seattle, they also had a lot of support to talk to me about what to expect and what to do. And, you know, and I, I had cards and, and all sorts of protocol that I knew to follow. Um, and so, but, but having said that, you know, you, uh, thinking that he was going to be back at our hotel room and waiting for the fever to happen or waiting for, for the signs, you know, it was like, will I, will I really spot it? 
will I really get him to back to the hospital on time quick enough? And, and the truth is, is that you do, because I did have to deal with that a few weeks after we returned. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in, in the beginning, you know, my first uh, side effect fever and, and the cytokine release syndrome, as you mentioned, uh, happened in the hospital. So the nurses were right on it and Sharon was watching and we were like, wow, that's amazing. And, you know, but it, 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 um, it, it wasn't a lot of fun. I mean, I'll say that it's not fun for the person watching. It wasn't fun for me as the person going through it. And, uh, um, but having said that, we, we did get through it and um, got back to our home away from home, which was, you know, kind of a mo hotel motel kind of a circumstance. And Sharon was right that I went through a second episode of CRS, which is not common for everybody. This was about three weeks later and my fevers came up again and, and she did, you know, we handled it properly and got back to the hospital and then a couple of days before we were supposed to go home, this is almost four weeks after the CAR T infusion. Um, Sharon noticed that I wasn't speaking as clearly as I'm speaking today. And I actually had a episode of neurotoxicity. So I went into a gibberish mode. And again, I mean, she recognized it even earlier than when it was really florid and was able to get me again back to the hospital. And we are here to live and we're talking about it. I mean, it, 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 it all's fine. Scary. It was scary. And, and it was also surprising because at the point in which the neurotoxicity happened, we were somewhat beyond the expectation that we, like we felt like, oh, you know, we didn't have to experience this. We're done. We're getting ready to go home. And, and then to see that he was just having this really off day and then things got to be a little more concerning and then as soon as he, he had his first his first true sign of messing up his words, I, I was on the phone and, and on the phone to 911. And, but, and then I, I stayed with him all night because they tried asking him questions and things came out like the Jabberwocky poem. <laughs> you know, it was just, there was nothing clear. There was no clear answer that he could give. And he tried so hard. Yeah. So I needed to be his voice. And so one of the things is, is I think caregivers are like the eyes and the ears and the voice for the patient. And I had to use my voice a few times to help get through the different episodes of, of um, health challenges that he had. And I, I think that's so critical. And But I do, I'm going to ask you a little bit about this, Sharon, because I know that was one of Patty's concerns. My wife's concern is she doesn't have medical training, but she took really good care of me. And at times I was not making the best choices for myself because I was out of it. Did you feel, um, how, how did you handle that? Because you're not medically trained. Um, you've lived with the doctor for decades, but still you're not medically trained. Did you feel like you're over your head? Did you feel that that must have been a challenge or scary? Would I get it right? Would I screw up on Larry? Did Or, or was he said, no, I got this. I, I got this nailed. No, you know, it, it's a, it, I, I think that's probably a concern for anyone who's watching this today, um, who, who will be, or is a caregiver. And I do have to say that I leaned on the medical staff as much as I felt I needed to. I never took any, I tried not to take anything for granted. When he was released from the hospital the first time, we came home with a list of medications, two, two pages long. And I started looking at that and I, I, I read about each and every drug and when it really should be given and when it shouldn't be given. And I finally looked at Larry and I said, you know what? I don't think that, that this table is actually correct. And so I made an appointment the next day with a pharmacist who went over every single drug and helped me repattern so that I knew exactly when to give him his medicines on every single hour, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, not being medical, and I think most of us aren't, aren't medical, we just need to do our best to ask questions. There's nurses, there's, there's really good support in CAR-T. 
whether it's at, in Seattle or, or the City of Hope or any other place you could go, they, they have staff to support. And the, the best advice I would have is to ask as many questions as you have. There's no question that isn't worth asking. And I kept notes. I have, um, <laughs> I have this every single day. I made notes about how he was feeling, what was awkward, you know, what were the patterns. Um, and, and it really ended up helping in, in a few cases mm -hmm. where, where doctors would look at us and say, I don't understand why all of a sudden your liver function is off and what did you do and what did you eat yesterday? And I had everything in my notes. And one day I was out on a walk and I called Larry and I said, I get it. I know what the, the only change is that you started taking this, this drug and they looked up the drug side effects and sure enough it was a problem with liver and so now we know that he can't take that particular drug mm -hmm. but um yeah so it's 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 interesting what you end up learning and if, if you're observant and you're you know you're staying focused on on the on the issues and, and i would emphasize don't be afraid to make that call um and, you know even if you know it's not like they're going to be upset and if you call and say no that's completely normal don't worry about it then it's, that's the best yeah. advice you could get or say, thank goodness you called. We better see him at the hospital about that or you better come in tomorrow morning and have a blood draw or whatever. Let them make that decision rather than you make that decision, take that burden off. So you, you look know, good. Had, Go ahead. Good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we had a protocol that, that um, if his temperature at any time while we were in our suite would be above 100.4 that we needed to call, and it was a Saturday night and sure enough, it was 100.4 and Larry looked at me and said, I don't wanna to go to the hospital. I do not wanna go in. And I said, well, that's fine, but I'm gonna make the call. And I made the call and I said, listen, we really wanna monitor this for another hour. Please give us another hour or two to see if it was just, if it will come down. And they were able to say to me, listen, we, we, see, we see the notes, we know that you'll call. So yes, yeah, stay, stay back for another hour or two. And sure enough, we, we I, I took him to the hospital that night, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I, but I think the point is, is that, that if you have good communication, not over communication, but just good, reliable communication with, with your healthcare team, they'll trust you. They'll, you know, it, you know, th things work. It's, it's, it's a partnership. So in the last couple of minutes we have here, Larry, how, how are you doing now? And remind us how long ago the CAR-T was and how are you doing now? Yeah, so, so knock on wood, I'm doing in the big picture, I call it very well. The CAR-T was infused December 19th, 2019. So we're about 16 months into it. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had a blood test for MRD, which is measurable residual disease. And this was a clonaseq test. So it was um, the one in a million sensitivity. And the test showed that I'm clean. I, they couldn't find to the level of their detection, they couldn't find any cells. So in the big picture, the CAR T is working. Now, full disclosure, you know, I'm working. Uh, I used to run marathons, I don't run anymore. We have a Peloton bike and we take walks and you know, the COVID has changed our lifestyle a little bit. But I have developed some side effects to the CAR-T. So it's, it's not like just thought to be um, without any uh, trouble. So I've developed a neuropathy in my feet and that may have been a side effect of the neurotoxicity. Nobody can really tell me, but, but I do have uh, numbness in the toes and bottom of my feet. And I've developed a, a, a cough. I have um, thickened bronchial tubes and they call it um, um, bronchiectasis. And I'm under treatment for that. And uh, that started really almost immediately my cough after I had the infusion. So although there's no real studies on how many people get this, I can point back to that. And so I have you know little bits of reminders every day that I had the treatment. Having said that big picture, we're very happy and we hope that it's gonna last, you know, as long as it's gonna last. I will tell everybody that because of COVID and because we were on a clinical trial and our clinical trial site was up in Seattle and we live in Northern California, we have not been able to revisit the trial site since we 
departed in January of 2020. So there's really been no research follow-up on how I'm doing. I can just report that on the big picture, I'm doing well, but this is, you know, it's a problem when you think about it, you go to a clinical trial site, that's where you're supposed to be followed. And um, so, you know, I'm fine, I think. And, uh, you know, when we can get up there again, we'll get up there and then they'll, they'll tell me. I think less than one in a million cells tells me that you're pretty fine and pretty fine. Um, and, and I suspect that, that you're shipping blood up because I'm still shipping blood up to Seattle three years later. Um, they, they ask for my blood every six months to a year. So I'm shipping up a whole bunch of tubes that I just get drawn locally because of the COVID. Any, any final thoughts? Um, Sharon, I'll start with you. Any final shots or shot, thoughts or advice you'd want to give to someone considering CAR-T? Because it's becoming, you know, I mean, as good as these targeted therapies are, you know, Larry's an example that if, you know, sometimes you just, you run out of hands to kick down the road and CAR-T is your next best choice. Right. Um, I think one of the things that I didn't talk about yet is just the support I had from family and friends. And if you have anyone that you could talk to, people want to help and people want to support you emotionally and, or at least they did for me. And, and I think that if you're considering and you do end up embarking on a CAR T journey, make sure that you have some people that will take your call. And that, I, I think that will also help, you know, I mean, it, you end up learning a lot. You end up really doing a lot. Um, but also it's, it, it's just really important. And I'm really grateful for the family and friends who, who uh, stood by me emotionally on the telephone and sometimes trips up to Seattle and, and, and the help I got and the help I got from our local family was just invaluable. Right. So I, I want to add that, you know, we're grateful for the cutting edge treatment and, yeah. um, it, it, and, and for, for folks who are watching this, you know, it's not just that Brian and I are family doctors, so we get CAR-T, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's available, it's cutting edge. I will say though, that it's not provided everywhere in the country. I mean, this, this is a research study and one has to go to a center that can provide the care. And not only is that, you know, troublesome sometimes to travel, but I want to say it's also expensive and there's a cost to this. And although clinical trials do reimburse for some costs, I find that in any trial I've been on or any trial I look at, they don't always reimburse for all the costs. And so um, this is something that, uh, you know, I, I hate to say that there is a, uh, there's decisions to be made both for treatment, for geography, for finances. I mean, it's not that the newer targeted medications are cheap anyway, right? And there are issues with that. Um, but I just wanna say that there, there are considerations. It, it, it's not just, well, let's go do it. I mean, I mean, if it was great for CLL, it would be approved as it is for some other blood cancers, but it's not yet approved. And so we all have to be cognizant of that and, and be ready to take a leap of faith. In, in my case, I'll just end by saying that every treatment I've had is what I consider a bridge to the next treatment. CLL is not something that can be cured. And even though my MRD tests are, are, are seemingly very good, I don't consider myself as cured. I consider myself on a bridge. And I hope that, you know, it's a long bridge. And if I ever get to the end of that bridge, then there will be new treatments that I'll be able to take advantage of. And um, I think that's the, uh, you know, that's the moral of the story is, is just one, one small step to another. I, I am so grateful for this. I will add that LLS has a very generous support program uh, that covers travel expenses specifically related to CAR-T and uh, Lazarex and we uh, helps with the cost for clinical trials. We have links to both of those on the website. 
um, and other areas of support and information are the LLS website. And of course, the CLL Society website has a big CAR-T section and a cartoon on explaining CAR-T. So you can become informed uh, on that. Uh, so you can make these decisions. There's groups that can help you. So you're not alone in this. There is tremendous support out there. Um, and I, I, I'm a big believer that this is the future. Um, and it's, I think it's not a distant future. I think it's near future. I, I can't thank you enough for the insights and the humanizing of this story, not the sugar coating of it, but it really is a happy ending, I think, for both of us in these circumstances, because we were kind of out of options. And then this was kind of a white night, you know, that really, and we jumped in on, on it when it, it's still experimental, but I think in a year or two from now, it's not going to be experimental and there'll be a lot more people doing it. So thank you so much and uh, God bless and uh, to many more years and a very, very long bridge uh, for both of us, uh, for all three of us. Uh, thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.